Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is taken from our Gospel lesson from Luke chapter 23, the account of the crucifixion of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'd like to focus especially on the 42nd verse, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is the text. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Christ Jesus, I've always had kind of a, shall we call it a monarchical strain. I mean, I, I like living in a constitutional republic. I'm very thankful for having my God-given liberties more or less protected in this country. But sometimes I really think it'd be neat to have a king. What if Alexander Hamilton had gotten his wish and George Washington had been crowned King George I of the United States of America. Not that he would have accepted a crown, but I think he would have made a pretty good king. I've seen people calculate who would have succeeded George Washington and who the royal family would be now if he had been king 200 years ago. When we look over at Britain, we see how much their people love their royal family. We all waited with bated breath to see what the sex would be of the uh, new Prince George. We hang on uh, every word that comes from the royal lips. The people just love their royalty. But you know, the more I think about kingship, about royal authority, the more I think that one of the big reasons the royal family is so well loved right now is that they have such little power. They're not able to tyrannize over their people. The fact is, most kings throughout history have been scoundrels who have had way too much power. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And most kings through history have grossly abused their power, used it for their own benefit, rather than for the benefit of their people. You look at the kingdom of Israel, a kingdom actually established by God Himself here on earth. God anointed the kings for this kingdom, and yet by far the vast majority of those kings were wicked leading their people away from the worship of the one true God, even putting to death God's prophets. Now, there were a few excellent kings. King David was quite a good king, a man after God's own heart, though even he had his moments. King Solomon started out pretty well, but unfortunately he turned away partway through his reign. King Hezekiah was a great king, as was King Josiah, all kings of Judah. But the fact remains that most kings, I think, have, have failed to be what kings are supposed to be. Those who truly and selflessly benefit their people by their royal office. You know, if I had a king, I would want him to be like my favorite king, King Aragorn, who ruled over the United Kingdom of Arnor and Gondor. He lived for over a hundred years, bringing peace and justice to his people. He was well loved by everyone. They would follow him anywhere, do anything he had commanded. Because they trusted him, they knew he had their best interests at heart. There's only one problem with King Aragorn. That is that he's fictional. He never existed. He was made up by my favorite author, J.R.R. Tolkien, for his Lord of the Rings series. And it's no wonder that J.R.R. Tolkien, a monarchist, would come up with the perfect king for his series. But you know, I think he was kind of on to something in his description of the perfect king, the ideal leader of men. When I read about King Aragorn, I want a king like that. And then I look around the world around me and I think, where can I find such a king? I don't think there's anyone on earth who could be a king like that. But you know, there is someone in heaven who is a king like that, who is a better king than that. 
Our Savior Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews and the King of the universe. And He is a King who rules not for His own benefit, but for the lasting benefit of us, His people. And you can see that nowhere more clearly than at His enthronement on the cross. Yes, it was on the cross that Jesus really took up His kingship over this world. It was on the cross that He faithfully discharged His kingly office, both by representing us, His people, serving as our mediator before God, and also as bestowing great gifts upon us, His people. And He did both right from the cross. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, it wasn't just as a a wretched man who was being tortured by his enemies. No, he was suffering and dying as the king of the world. It was a kingly act for him to go to the cross and suffer and die. And it's interesting when I look at the two thieves, the two criminals crucified on either side of our Savior, My mind goes back to the sons of Zebedee, whose mom came to Jesus asking a favor for them. She asked Jesus, Grant to my sons to sit on your right hand and your left in your kingdom. Just like a mom. They won't go themselves, but they can count on mom to go for them. And Jesus answers her, Can they drink the cup that I am to drink? And they say, oh, yes, we can. And he says, well, very well, you will drink the cup that I'm going to drink, but it's not mine to determine who will sit on my right hand and my left. That's been prepared for them by my Heavenly Father. Now, I wonder if those sons of Zebedee had any idea what they were saying when they said, oh, yeah, we can drink your cup. Because what was the cup of Jesus Christ? It was the cup of which he spoke in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night in which he was betrayed when he prayed fervently to his Father, Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And indeed, it pleased God the Father to give to Jesus Christ the cup, the cup of his wrath, the cup of suffering and death, to have Jesus drain that cup to the dregs. That was Jesus' cup. His suffering and death was His enthronement, His reigning in glory. And so it is true, the sons of Zebedee did drink of that cup. They too were tortured and killed. But as it turns out, it was not granted to them to sit at the right hand and the left of Jesus in His enthronement. No, it seems to have been prepared for two criminals... Two criminals who drank the cup of Jesus and suffered and died on a cross with Him. One on His right hand and one on His left. Dying there on the cross, flanked by these criminals, our Savior Jesus Christ was working out the salvation of the world, giving up Himself, His body, His blood, as the precious price for our salvation and forgiveness, a truly kingly act. But you know, it wouldn't be enough if Jesus had simply died and left it at that. Martin Luther says, if Christ had died a thousand times, it would do no good. It is preaching, preaching, preaching. In order for Jesus' death on our behalf to benefit us, it has to be preached to us. We have to hear about it. We have to learn it and know it and believe it in our heart of hearts. And so what Jesus did from the cross is not only the kingly act of serving as mediator for His people, suffering and dying in their place and on their behalf. No, Jesus also gave promises from the cross. He preached from the cross. And what did He preach? He preached the blessed fruit of what He was doing then and there on the cross. He preached the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. 
He pronounced forgiveness upon his tormentors, beseeching his Father in heaven for mercy for their sakes. Those who were torturing him, killing him, tormenting him, it was for them specifically that he besought mercy. And then, when this thief on the cross, who speaks up for Jesus in his last moments, asks Jesus for that signal mercy to remember me when you come into your kingdom. To him, Jesus gives some of the most blessed words in all of Holy Scripture. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What Christian has died with more assurance than that wretched criminal who heard from Jesus' own lips on the day of his death that today you will be with me in paradise. These words, of course, are for that thief who confessed Jesus as the Christ, who sought mercy from him, but they're also for all whom Jesus would call for him to himself. They're for that other thief who railed at him and blasphemed him. They're for the soldiers who mocked him, for the rulers who derided him, for the people who stood by and watched and did not speak up for him. For Pilate, who condemned him to death unjustly. For the crowd that handed him over to be crucified. For the disciples who abandoned him. For the sinful people that he came to save. For us and for all the world. Those words are intended for every sinner who has ever been born into this world. Who has ever been conceived in sin and death and brought under the wrath of God the Father. To every sinner. Jesus has at the ready the promise, Today you will be with me in paradise. And this is so much more than that criminal had asked for. What did he ask? He asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I wonder, what was this man thinking of? Probably he was thinking of Jesus coming again in glory, as the prophets had foretold, on clouds and throned visibly at the right hand of his Father. This criminal was thinking, when Jesus comes again, when He establishes His earthly kingdom, I want Him to remember that I trusted in Him here on the cross. I couldn't turn my life around. I was fastened to a cross. I couldn't resolve to do better because in a few minutes my life would be cut short. But I sought mercy from Him. I confessed faith in Him. And so please, my Savior... When you come into your kingdom, when you establish your visible kingdom here on earth, remember me. Do not cast me away from your presence, but bring me into your eternal and heavenly kingdom. This is a great blessing that this criminal was asking for, but it was a blessing that for him was far in the future. But Jesus gives him even more than that. He gives him the promise that today, when those nails have done their work, when they come to break your legs so that you can no longer push yourself up for air, when you finally succumb to the torture and give up the ghost, your spirit will fly straight to heaven to be with me, to be with your King, to be comforted in the bosom of Abraham, there to wait in blessedness for the final establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. Let those be Jesus' words to you today, as we all ask Him fervently, Lord, remember us when you come into your kingdom. He says to us, yes, I am your king, I am your ruler, I will protect and defend you, and I will remember you not only when I come on the last day, but even at the moment of your death, I will take you straight to myself in heaven, where you will wait with me, the eternal life of everlasting blessedness in the new heavens and the new earth. And so, let this be our daily prayer. Lord Jesus, remember us when you come into your kingdom. And in his mercy, our crucified King and God will truly remember us and bless us everlastingly. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.